The 2021 Global Peace Index has ranked Nigeria 146 among 163 independent nations and territories according to its level of peacefulness. Nigeria moved one step from 147 in 2020, though it still ranked eighth amongst the least peaceful countries in Africa after South Sudan, Somalia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, Libya, Central African Republic, Sudan, and Mali. In the report released, Nigeria finished with 2,712 points and was graded low on the state of peace. Describing the situation, the report said that Nigeria continues to face challenges in safety and security saying the conflict between government forces and Boko Haram in the northeast led to the killing of about a thousand people in 125 fatal incidents in 2020, making the average of 13 deaths per violent event in Boko Haram insurgency of last year. Well, joining us to discuss this is Aroro Obo. He is a foreign affairs expert and Doni Oguemi is a Rotary Peace Fellow. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. I'll, go, I'll start with you because you obviously understand the situation, uh, you know, across the Sahel and the reason why some of these countries uh, around the Sahel keep having this issue of insecurity and how they have been able to handle it. And then we'll bring it to Nigeria. Um, so there's an armed struggle. I mean, I remember last year I, I, I talked about something uh, that happened in Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso had to deal with a three-pronged problem. They, deal, they dealt with insecurity, they were dealing with some form of farming, and they also had to deal with COVID-19. Just give us a brief idea as to what's happening in the Sahel and how it's affecting us here in Nigeria. So, as I said, the Sahel has been, has been in trouble for, for several years now. If you date back... Um, um, 20, 20 years ago, when the drought and the famine and the desertification began to affect, uh, to a large extent, many, most parts of the Sahel. And, you know, the, the countries around this, um, uh, the Sahel haven't done much for, for those years. Rather than um, work um, and look for sort of secondary solutions to resolving the problems, they sort of, um, you know, drag their feet on many of those issues. And it would worsen their situation, have to deal a lot also with political instability, uh, together with environmental problems facing uh, several parts of uh, the Sahel. So, uh, if you if you if you take your mark, your mind back, a typical um, case study for you to look at is what is going on with the Lake Chad Basin. The Lake Chad Basin, from 1960 till date, has lost about 90% of, of its coverage area. And um, if you if you look at the satellite images uh, from 1960, and then you you, 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 you take it back into today, you see that millions of people who have depended on the Lake Chad Basin for survival have now become refugees because um, they cannot farm, they cannot fish. And then what has also worsened the situation for many of them also too, is um, you've had the, uh, because of their, their, their basic uh, means of survival, survival isn't taken away from them. It means now that the poverty levels they have increased um, significantly. All Nigeria needs to, if you look at the global um, peace index from, nine, from 2008 till date, you see that Nigeria hasn't really improved. We've moved from um, uh, 242, the best being maybe 230, 240, 241, 240. And all of this coincides with what's happening in um, the north, northeastern part of the country. So you see, it just shows you that no real work has been done in resolving many of those issues, beginning first with the environmental issues, which have now began to affect the economic uh, situation in most of these countries uh, in the Sahel. I'll, I, I want to push you further because you have said that nothing has really been done. So does it mean that political will has been the issue in all of those areas around the Sahel, including Nigeria? You're saying that uh, there's more, much more of talking and reporting than the political will to deal with you know, the situation in the Sahel, is that it? Exactly, exactly. Take Nigeria as a case study. If you look at most of the development indices uh, running back from the 90s into 2000, you see a, you see a ticking time bomb in uh, the way um, the numbers have risen. Numbers of children who are out of school, you find them major in those areas. Those who don't have access to good health care, who don't have access to, um, uh, to education, health care, and good infrastructure. There's so much ungoverned area in many of these places. So you see, not being able to deal with this 
problems, you find out that you find the same problems play out across most part of the Sahel, in Niger, in Chad, and the government that have been there have perpetuated themselves in office some way to solve the problem by saying, even if we cannot um, uh, provide the, the basic necessities, we can throw away the jackboots and bury and wear the Agbada or the suits like in Chad's case, where uh, Idris Deby was there for, uh, from the 90s. The irony is that what Deby has had sought to stri strike out of Chad, for example, is what ended up killing him. I mean, if you've been there for de multi decades and at the end of the day, you're going to have to lose your life to an armed insurgency. It just shows you that um, not much work has really been done in terms of uh, using the primary solutions to solve the primary problem. So we need to get back to the basics and getting and dealing with, the, with what, what the real problems are with the countries in the Sahel. Uh, beyond getting the guns and all of that to, to um, uh, kick away poverty, it's never worked. The, the gun boats have never driven away poverty. They would have to invest critically in education, in health care, in the provision of jobs and an environment that people can find and strive uh, to earn a good living. Hmm. Let me go to Donny. Donny, you have worked with Rotary and you have been part of some peace committees. I'm guessing that you are aware of what Nigeria is going through and, you know, Agogo has outlined all of the problems and where we have loopholes. As someone who's a peace fellow, you obviously would have some solutions that we can maybe, you know, take advantage of or maybe our leaders might be willing to listen to. But in all of your research, what do you think can be the solution or a starting point in addressing the situation that we're having, especially here in Nigeria, because it's really bad if Africa's most populated country and supposed big brother, uh, you know, is facing what it is facing today. The deep dive of the Naira, uh, the fact that the economy is in some shambles. I mean, this, the cost of living is rising high. Robbery, kidnapping. I mean, the list is endless. What, where do we start from? I'll take it from where he's, you know, left off. You know, he ended by saying enough of the guns, and now it's time to begin to do um, something more preventive. So what it looks like the government has been doing in terms of approach is trying to contain violence, you know, rather than prevent it. You know, and preventing it is takes a lot more effort than um, just going there and trying to stop it with force you know, using that hard power that they continue to use. So back to the basics. The major cause for our poverty, you know, the poverty 40% or more Nigerians are experiencing at the moment is that they do not have access to livelihood. And as long as that remains, the youth will remain restless and they will take to streets, they will take to, to violence, they will take to anything that can be, bring that. So the first thing will be um, improve the economy via, you know, investing in people and investing in the environment in which they live and work and schooling. I also want to talk about security. You know, I mean, there's just, we cannot begin to talk about how bad the security situation is now. So when you, when you put the fact that there are young people there that can't work, that affects security in itself. And insecurity itself also affects the um, ability to get good jobs and to work freely. And so all of this is just a vicious cycle. And the other thing is people having that sense that there's, there's justice, you know, that there's some equitability in terms of resource um, that is available to people. As long as that gap is still so wide be between who is rich and who is poor, I mean, we are going to continue to have this kind of situation. So rather than use the gun to prevent protests, in the last um, June 12th, we had the government quickly coming out to say that um, if the police was going to be on the street, they're not going to allow this. And we saw it happen. You know, what would have been better is diplomacy, to call people to the table and say, what are the problems? How can we begin to solve the problems? Okay, where can we take it from? What is the roadmap? How do we ensure people are educated enough? How do we ensure they are skilled? How do we ensure that they have leadership ability and they have a sound business environment? You know, you don't begin to make things tougher and tougher, mm. especially for young people. And that's really where Rotary comes into it, ensuring that key things like health, key things like economy, 
they are looking into it by building leadership skills among young people and uh, women. I'm a beneficiary of the Rotary Peace Fellowship, for instance, and so many others and working in different ways. But apart from organizations like Rotary, we need the government to step in and begin to do good government. Um, and, and, I, and I want to jump in there to quickly ask you, because you're saying you've given us, you know, likely solutions and what government needs to focus its attention to. Government has come up with, you know, all kinds of programs in the name of trying to lift people out of poverty. The president came out the other day to say he's lifted about 10 million people out of poverty. We're yet to see those people anyway, so th that's still questionable. Um, but as a Rotary Peace Fellow, and I'm sure that you see it on several, com com several committees uh, that are advocating for things to be done differently, what's been the response of government, especially the government of Nigeria, uh, to, to these ideas that you've brought to the table? Have they been receptive? Have they taken any of these into consideration? Well, it may be fair to say perhaps they want to take into consideration, but it's a bit of scratching the surface. So rather than say that we want to employ 1,000 young people in 774 local governments um, over three months, that, that, that will not lift anybody. If you only pay them for the three months and it's over, that will not lift people out of poverty. Lifting people out of poverty will make sure that public institutions where the children of the common man can afford to go, it remains, renders quality service, both in education and health in education and health, as long as it is not within the reach of that regular person, common man, then the government has not started. So they need to put funding more in those areas. Okay. And we're not, we're not seeing it. We're All right. It. I'm bouncing back to you, Agogo. Um, there's the saying that there are people who always benefit from, you know, these types of situations, uh, insecurity, um, you know, war. There are people who'd rather not this you know wars end because they are benefiting from it I'll, I'll take your mind back to all the all the way to 2017 when we started seeing guns coming into the country no one's claiming them uh the most recent was i think 2018 or 2019 these guns keep coming but nobody's able to trace we've not had any intel till today as to where these guns are coming from one was stopped by in south africa another was traced back to turkey and it keeps coming back and forth. Um, and you know how expensive a gun is. So the fact that we are seeing our government unable to deal with the situation, even though we keep talking about the lack of political will, other people who are benefiting from this, who supposedly might be also part of the government or politicians, and that's why this is not going away anytime soon. Absolutely. It's not going away anytime soon because of... Um a lot of what is going on is out of the hands of um, the state actors. If you take your mind back to 2011, when Muammar Gaddafi was um, in charge of Libya, he had a band of fighters from all across um, the Sahel, who, as mercenaries in Kay, who came to fight um, for him. Many of those guys, after Gaddafi's ouster, found their way back to their home countries to cause mayhem in those countries. In fact, you can trace the radicalization, swift radicalization of Boko Haram. Uh, back to the uh, after Gaddafi years and um, the the problems you also had in Mali, most of those weapons um, were there. So, if you don't if you don't have a regional sort of force which can man uh, the Sahel, where you have these criminal elements and non-state actors, and which I do say they, they keep growing in num growing in numbers. Uh, the fact you have someone like Abubakar um, Shakar who's who's now being killed uh, by SWAP um, is one sign of um, relief to, to a number of people, but poses a bigger problem because the SWAP, which is um, the group responsible uh, for his ouster, according to reports we're getting, have um, now a foothold over the northeastern part of um, the country. And um, knowing what they did in the in the Middle East, they could, po they could pose a more uh, formidable danger with a lot of connection and network. Uh, there's the AQIM. So the Sahel is just um, what you say is... Um, is just sitting right there in the garden, you know, to be plucked. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, the countries of, of, of bordering the Sahel haven't done much in that regard to um, stop this. The president even admitted, in, uh, that Nigerian president, that uh, he, he shut the borders, but yet the, the weapons uh, still came in. Coming and so in. it means that um, closing the borders still won't give you, uh, put a stop to those weapons. And uh, on, on account of Gaddafi weapons continue 
um, to roam freely across the Sahel and into any country. You know, it's a game of it's a game of the weakest link. Any country uh, that is um, is, is, um, is territorial border force isn't strong enough to stop them. They'll find their way in. Algeria chased them back into the desert, and so they found their way in countries like uh, Mali, Niger, Chad, and Nigeria. Unfortunately. Well, uh, on that sad note, <laughs> I want to say thank you to you. Agogo Obo is uh, an international um, news expert. And of course, I want to say thank you to you, uh, Doi Ogunyemi, for being part of the conversation. She is a Rotary Peace Fellow. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being part of the conversation. Thank you very much. All right. Well, on that note, we say thank you for being part of the show tonight. We'll see you on Monday on Plus Politics. I am Mariana Cohn. Have a good evening. <laughs>